All right, so who here is excited that the kids are back in school? Woo! Who's here is excited for all of the busyness of the fall schedule? I heard a lot fewer woohoos. Substantial lot fewer woohoos. It's fall. Things get going. I heard a substantial fewer lot of woohoos when it came to the busyness of the fall schedule. I've been talking for the last uh, two weeks about busyness, about how we can be going down in our life. We can be crashing in our life for two equal but different reasons. And the first one is if you're in a plane, you can be nose diving. Just nose down, everything is going down, right? Have you ever been there in your life? Just everything's going to pot and you know it. But there's a second sneakier reason we can be going down in life, often related to busyness. There's a second sneakier reason why we can be going down in life. And that's called a stall. And a stall is essentially where the angle of attack, the angle of your wing, is so high compared to your velocity, how fast you're going, that there's no longer air on the wings and you can be dropping like a stone with your nose pointed up. And what I was saying last time was that that's the sneakier, more common thing that happens in North America. That we think we're doing well, we're doing all of these things, we're, we're succeeding, we're connecting, we're part of the church, we're part of the community, whatever it is. And yet our life seems to be going down and down and down and you're frustrated and you're busy and you're hassled and you crash. You crash. So as we're ramping up into fall, school schedule, church schedule, all that sort of stuff, I wanted to talk about going from good to great in your Christian Going good to great in your community life. Going from good to great in your family life. Going good to great in your relationship with God. And we want to talk about that. So before we talk about that, I'm going to draw. Okay, I'm really, really, really good at drawing with uh, dry erase. A stick man. All right? Look at that. Isn't that the best stick man you've seen this morning? Awesome. Okay, now we're going to draw some connections here. All right? These are relationships, these are connections, these are committees, these are places where a person might be involved in, like, oh, some people can't see. Where are some places, where are some people, relationships you might be involved in? Just call them out. School. School. What's another one? Work. That's a good one. What else? Keep calling. Church. Church. Ooh, you guys jumped in very quickly. I like that. Sports. Sports. What else? Coffee. Coffee? Sure. I have a relationship with coffee, but it's private and personal. What else? Kids? Family? Yeah, family. Oh, there's a good one. Hobbies. Coffee slash hobbies. Coffee's a hobby for me. What else? Jesus. Oh, there's a relationship. I feel bad as a pastor. It took us a long time to get there. Your relationship with Jesus or God. What else? Well, we don't have friends on there. Don't have time for friends. What else you got? Neighbors. Oh, that's a really good one. Spouse. Oh, wow. Neighbors. I before E except after C. You were sounding like A's and neighbors. Spouse. Okay, that's a good, that's a good for list for now. All right. Are you liking the way this looks? Is this looking happy? Is this looking easy? Is this looking balanced? I'll move it forward a little bit because some of you aren't shaking your head no. I think it's because you can't see it well enough. But are we really done here? Really? Are we actually done? I mean, let's look at work. Do, do both your spouses work sometimes? Do both the spouses work, the husband and wife? Often, there's actually work one and work two. Work one, work two. Maybe a part-time job, maybe two jobs. Is this, is this a real thing? And then, and then with that, there's the work Christmas parties, maybe? Right? Is that a thing? I know when we and guests first got married, that first year we had married, between our extended family, our close family, our extended, extended family, two different jobs, we had 13 Christmas parties in December. 13. We decided some people were getting cut after that. What about sports? I'm assuming you're meeting kids' sports. Because I think if it's an adult sports, we're going to put that in our hobbies because none of you are pro sports players. So we've got adult sports. Kid sports, is it just one? How many, how many sports are your kids involved in, in, in combined? 
eight? Eight? Is there hockey? Baseball in summer? Lacrosse? Football? I don't know. Soccer? Each of your kids are involved in another sport as well, right? That's, that's how it goes. Kids? I put kids plural because you got more than one kid maybe. Maybe your kids are growing up, right? This kind of goes under, under the family in general. Maybe you've got kids who moved away. They don't live around here anymore. I know my brother lives in Mexico. He's not my kid, but he's my brother. And he lives in Mexico. So if I want to visit him, I've got to fly to Mexico or more likely have him fly this way. Or we talk on the phone, right? That takes some time. Am I, am I correct? Or, or maybe, and we don't like to talk about this in church, but what about divorce? Or kids with an ex-girlfriend or ex-husband or ex-boyfriend, right? Doesn't that get complicated? Now you're visiting and trying to balance Christmas and Easter with maybe multiple kids, split families, blended families, that's a thing. Maybe kids have just moved away. Um, in Des family, we got family in Vancouver, we got family in Toronto, I got family in Mexico. So family, you got your kids, you got maybe your in-laws live somewhere else, right? Children live, maybe your empty nesters. Friends, do you have one friend? Two friends, three friends? Do you see where I'm going? Is it, is it hard to keep up with them? You got your friend that you made that... That was from the old workplace that you worked at 15 years ago. And once a year, you still get together for coffee. And you only get caught up about halfway through the year before the coffee's done. And so then the next year, you actually only have finished the last year before you can even start this year. You have that relationship too? Am I the only one who's got this trail of old friends from old things that you try to keep in contact with? I don't know what you did in the days before Facebook, so I can just like their post and then I feel like I'm connected to them, right? See what I'm saying? We can keep going. Church. You, sh you throw up in church. You throw up. You show up in church. You know what statistics tell us? Psychologists tell us, surveys tell us, when somebody joins a church, when they walk in through that back door, in the first three months, they have to make six meaningful connections as a family to feel connected to that church and to be likely to stay past a year. Six. What does that mean? I don't know. Father's going to be on the board. Mother's on some young mom's group. Kids in kids' church. Maybe they help out in uh, worship team or maybe they join up. Maybe, yeah, they're helping out in the coffee team, hospitality. That's a great place. There's six meaningful connections that you have to make in a church in three months to stay. Feeling overwhelmed yet? Anybody? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you're feeling overwhelmed? The call and response is working great this morning. Amen? Amen. Woo! Love it. Thank you so much. And then on top of that, I come up here and I stand here and I say, guess what's happening? I come up here and I say, small groups. Everybody get involved in small groups. Small groups are the new thing for fall. We're going to be launching small groups. We're going to be having small groups. We need small group leaders. We need small group posts. You need to join a small group. Every week we're going to meet with a small group and you go, small group. That's a big one. Oh, we're supposed to be involved in small groups. How is this supposed to work? You're feeling overwhelmed. There's an old proverb, an old Chinese proverb. The beginning of all wisdom is to call something by its real name. The beginning of all wisdom is to call something by its real name. What is this? Can you name this? Call it a real name. Busy? Chaos? What else? Stress? What else? Chaos, insanity, what else? A board that I drew on. Well, this is factual. I like that. This is a board that I drew on. My name is Jason. Hi. Stress, busy, worry, insanity, chaos. Unmanageable. Disconnected. Hassle. Are these all words we can describe? The beginning of wisdom is to call something by its real name. There are people here who call this life. But I don't call this living. I call this stalling. I call this crashing with your nose pointed up. Right? Crashing with your nose pointed up. The average family in this building statistically has 35 connections and they don't connect with each other. So your work friends, don't talk to your church friends, don't be, aren't seen at your kids' church sport or your kids' sports things. 
aren't connected with your neighbor, who isn't connected with your relationship with Jesus, who isn't one of your close friends, who isn't part of your family. 35 separate lines make your life on average in the average North American family, and your lines don't touch. I know this is as indicting to you as it is to me, but it's true. Call something by its real name, right? The beginning of wisdom is to call something by its real name. What's a friend? What's the real name for a friend? Somebody you used to be close with and now you connect once a year. Somebody you knew at your old work and now you have a like on Facebook. Is that, is that basically what your friends are? I apparently have, I don't know, 670 friends. So I talk to two of them a day in a cycle. Or if you're like, one a day, it takes me a year, two years to get through all of my friends. Is this true? Is this relationship? Is this connection? Is this intimacy? Does this matter? Is this anything more than just hassle and stress in your life? Psychologists also tell us that in each one of these relationships, you're playing a different character. Amen? So if somebody comes into your workplace and says, amen, do you yell, amen, praise Jesus, at your workplace? But if I say amen here, you say amen. If I say I have a backache, you say, can I pray for you, brother? But if somebody at school says I have a backache, you say, oh, have you tried Rebecca's set? Right? You're playing a slightly different character. I mean, I'm picking on, on the outward examples, but the reality is you're playing a different character. Do you want to feel real pressure? Invite me down to your workplace to talk about God. How many of your friends know you love Jesus? A lot of compartmentalizing, isn't there? A lot of compartmentalizing. You have 35 different relationships on average as a North American family, and you're playing a slightly different role in each one of them. And psychologists tell us you have forgotten who you really are. You don't know who you are anymore. You are drowning in connection. And it's a disease that has a name. It's called crowded loneliness. Crowded loneliness. You are surrounded by people. You are virtually drowning in people and things to do and things to be a part of. And you have no deep, meaningful connection. No intimacy no real people in your lives, or so few, and they're so diluted, you're drowning in connection. Your nose is up and you're falling. And here we come along as a church, here I come along as a pastor, and I talk about all these things to add. Small groups to add. I believe in the power of small groups. Personally, I do. They've had such a huge impact in my life. At almost every major struggle I've had in the last... 10 years, a small group has been absolutely instrumental in caring for me, in praying for me, in building me up. I believe in the power of small groups. I've seen lives transformed by them. <clears throat> but not by making a 36th connection to the 35 you're already juggling. North Americans are the loneliest people, self-reported loneliest people on the planet. Go to war-torn Somalia. Go to a Lebanese refugee camp filled with uh, expat Syrians. And they will not rank themselves as lonely as North Americans will. How can we be lonely though? Look at everybody here. Look at all of our connections. Look at all of our friends. We rank ourselves as the loneliest people on the planet. Genesis 2, verses 18. It's not my key verse. If you want to my key verse, you can turn to Luke 10 already. But Genesis 2, verses 18. Then the Lord God, who's creating the world, and he creates the trees and the water and the light and the dark and the animals. He said, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is good. Then in verse 18, he looks and says... Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. It is not good to be alone. It is not good to be alone. That's not saying it is good to be drowning in connections, crowded in loneliness. It's not good to feel alone. It's not good to stand alone. This is God talking. 
This is not good, says the Lord our God. There was a wonderful study. I looked at heart patients who went through open heart surgery and the recovery afterwards. It's quite a large study, statistically significant. What they found was there was two very, very large factors that contributed to healthy recovery and everything else ranked much, much lower. That's a quality of hospital. That wasn't the doctor who worked on them. It wasn't their age. It wasn't their physical exercise beforehand. Those were all ranked third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and below. The top two determinants for recovery from heart patients was depth of connection with other people. Not number, depth of connection with other people. And number two, if people rank themselves as gaining comfort from religion. Let's put this a simpler way. Love man, love your God. Is it almost like a few thousand years ago, Jesus knew what was good for our hearts? Is this, is this blowing your mind? That Jesus, without any sort of medical degree, knew what was good for our hearts. In fact, Luke 10, this is our key verse. 27 to 28, you can turn with me. Jesus is being challenged. It says, he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the man says. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly, he told them. Do this and you will live. You will have life abundant. Do this and you will barely survive. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will barely survive. Do this and you will live. Do this or this. This or life. Why do we choose this? Why do we choose this? We sum up love God, I think, as trusting God to do stuff for us. And we sum up love our neighbors as doing stuff for them. We sum up love God as trusting God to do stuff for us, and we sum up love our neighbors as doing stuff for our neighbors. Is that what Jesus meant? Is that what the Bible meant? What if, just, just, just come with me here for a minute, okay? Come with me on this journey for just one minute. What if God didn't mean for it to be this way? What if this wasn't Jesus' plan? What if this was never what he wanted for you? What if he meant love the Lord your God with all your strength and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself? What if that was supposed to be fun? What if that was supposed to bring joy? What if that was supposed to bring life? What if that was supposed to make you feel good? What if when you woke up in the morning you were like, yes, I get to love God and love my neighbors and fill myself with the love of God and share that with others? Wouldn't that be amazing? Instead of, oh my goodness, I've got PTA today. I got to get to work. And I have that coffee thing with old friends. And I got to try to quickly prepare for my small group yet on Wednesday. What if that wasn't what God meant? I'm just going to switch here for a bit. We say at the open door, if you read the back of our bulletin, it says family, faith, and freedom. What if this wasn't what we meant by family because this is in freedom and it's not founded on faith? What if this wasn't what we meant by family? When we actually have real deep intimacy, real connection with people, it brings life. It's like when Adam was lying on the ground in the dust and Eve had been formed beside him and they were literally made out of the same flesh. And the same God had breathed the same breath in both of them. And they were side by side. And God looked down and he said, what did he say it was? This is very good. Very good. He breaks the narrative. This is good. This is good. This is good. Guys, this is not good. Get connected in real intimacy. And it's very good. You don't get drawn up into who God is alone. 
I just did a wedding yesterday. That was very good. That was real intimacy. That was real meaning. That was real relationship. That was very good. So, so crowded loneliness is killing us. It's killing our hearts. It's killing our joy. It's killing our witness. Because who wants what we have if we don't even want what we have? Right? What kind of witness is this? Come and join the church. We're going to add 13 more things to your schedule until you can't walk by Friday. Okay, so I'm going to pretend like you guys are my advisors. All right, you guys are my advisors, and I got a problem. We all recognize. Can we all nod our head? Is this a problem? Does this need a solution? All right, so I want you guys to rattle off. What's your advice as my advisors? What should I be doing? What should I be doing here? Call it out. What would you like to do to your schedule? Chop it off? Minimize? What else? Those are good. What? Prioritize. That's good too. What else? Deschedule. What else? Ask God which ones he says we should do. Yeah, it's kind of like prioritize too, right? That's using God to prioritize. So that's the more holy answer actually. Consolidate. That's a good one too. Well, let's start here. Let, let me imagine that I'm taking all your guys' advice, okay? Let, let, me just, let me just walk this one through. Let's play a little, a little mental game. So, so I heard a lot of trim, snip, cut, simplify, minimize, right? Those are all words I heard. So let's cut. Let's snip. Let's, let's practice this one, okay? So um, for Sunday lunch, we're going to my in-laws. So I'm going to call them up after this, and I'm going to say, uh, Annette, my mother-in-law, uh, I, I was just preaching, and, 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 you know, it was really convicting to me. And, you know, that, that handsome, wise preacher sure made some good, really good comments and remarks, and it really hit home, and it meant something to me. And I want to practice that handsome preacher's advice. And, and so uh, I have too many relationships. I have 35. And he was talking about how we need to trim and snip and cut. And so I'm sorry, Annette, but um, uh, you don't make the cut. And, and so I'm going to hang up now. And I might talk to you next year when you have more time for you. Why do I automatically become the mother-in-law? Because it's fun. And she's not here. And she's so nice, she's still going to feed me chicken later on today. I'm going to call up my work. Yeah, you know, I'm actually really, I'm, I'm just too busy. So I'm going to go on EI now for a while. And I'm, I just hope it's all going to work out. Because uh, I have too many connections and my pastor said I need to snip. Look, that's good advice, guys, but it's ultimately really, it's just not that practical, is it? I mean, how do you do that? Who do you cut in your family? Do you want to cut your friends? Well, your neighbors are your neighbors. You need to move. I mean, I moved far away from everybody, so that works for me. Cut God, school, your spouse, your work, your church. Small groups are actually really good. How do you do this? We're going to try a little, uh, a little experiment here. Now, I'm, going to, I'm going to show you how good I am at drawing because I can, I'll repeat my amazing stick man. He's a little bigger so you can see him. I'm going to write neighbor. Whoa, whoa, neighbor doesn't have a U. What if your neighbor, the person who lives beside you, okay, so, so, so imagine you're on your front door. The person to your left, all right? What if your neighbor was the guy you went biking with on weekends? And what if, what if the person who your kids play sports with, you know that person who sits in the stand beside you? What if they came biking with you? And what if, what if together, I'll get a different color pen here. What if together, that was your small group? In, in fact, what if, what if we got really wild here and we put God and our relationship with Jesus in, into that small group? And what if these people were the same people you went to the same church with? You see where I'm going with this? What if we actually liked the people we hung out with? What would happen if we actually liked to spend time with the people we were connecting with? What would happen if 
this fall, instead of starting a small group in a different community with different people who you don't already know, what if you endeavored to find the small groups closest to you? What if you invited your friends? What if you invited your employees, your coworkers? In fact, what we did when we did 40 Days in the Word is I talked to as many people from as many different communities as I could find so that we had one in St. Jean and one in Albany and three or four in Morris and one in Low Farm and one in Rosenord so that there was one close to everybody because I think this is better than this. I can't manage that. I can't manage that. I can manage this. And in fact, uh, a little over a year ago, there was a guy named John. He was helping me out in my house for a while. That was awesome. That was awesome. Because the guy I worked with was the guy I came to church with, was the guy I ate lunch with, was the guy who came over to watch movies with me, was the guy I prayed for, was the guy I was walking with. It was the same guy. And you know what? He became a very, very good friend of mine. And you know what? Our relationship was pretty awesome, and it was life-giving to me. It never felt like a drain to me because I actually just liked hanging out with the guy. What if you were meant to like hanging out with the people in church? Some of you just woke up there. Are you hearing me? What's your life like? Have you actually drawn out your connections? You can smell a challenge coming, by the way, can't you? I'm already pivoting towards the challenge. Here's the deal. We're launching up for fall, and we're starting small groups. There's a bunch of small groups that are going from last year. There's some new ones that are probably starting soon, too, as well. And that's awesome, and that's great. But I would actually like to see just about everybody in a small group. But I don't want this to be an extra thing on top of all your other things. I would love, I would love, I would love for this to actually be a consolidation of schedules. So the people you have small group with are the people you want to hang out with are the people you have coffee with, are the people you do sports stuff with. Wouldn't that be amazing? Would that be freeing? Would that feel like extra? Or would that feel like it might be freeing? I'm going to invite the band to come up. I want to issue a challenge to you this morning, and I'm really serious about this challenge. Because I believe in the power of small groups, but I don't believe in the power of busy. Busy is definitionally a distraction from who God is to you. Busy by definition, stress by definition interferes with your relationship with Jesus. Too many connections, crowded loneliness kills, discourages, frustrates, waters down till there's no effect. I want to challenge you this week. Sit down as a family. Just sit down with a family and draw your diagram. Draw your diagram at all your different connections. And I want one key principle in your mind. Trade lines for circles. Where can you trade lines for circles? What if your friends, your family, your church, your small group, what if they were in a 10-mile radius? What if you weren't driving halfway across the country? I mean, you can't change it, right? My brother lives in Mexico. I can't change that. But I don't mind having one extra connection in my week if I don't have 34 other connections to make in the week. Am I, am I right? Am I right? What if we traded lines for circles? What if we loved God and loved our neighbor? For real. And what if we did that and we lived as a church? I'm going to be laying out in the next couple of weeks a few more concrete steps. I'm just kind of like flying over really quick over some of these concepts. But I want to spend some time on this this fall about how do we do stuff that matters more. Do less, but do what matters more. And I want to invite you to come with me on that journey. I'm going to get you to bow your head now, though. And I want to pray about this, because this is huge, I think. Lord God. Lord God, I don't believe for a second you want us to be busy. I don't believe for a second you want us to feel hassled, like we're running around and don't matter. Lord God, I believe you want to know who we are. Lord God, that you speak our name. That you want us to know the sound of your voice. 
Lord God, that level of intimacy doesn't happen by running from place to place to place. Lord Jesus, it only happens when we connect with you and when we connect meaningfully with your children, with our neighbors, with our brothers and sisters. Lord God, right now I ask that you just move amongst us. Help us know you. Help us connect to you. Help us to understand, Lord God, who you are. Help us trade lines for circles. I pray all this in your precious and holy name, Lord God. Amen. Yeah, that was a good message. That is something I struggle with a lot. I have a very, very hard time with that because when you love so many things, you just enjoy them so much, it's... It, you really, you need the spirit to come and guide you and to help you to figure out what that looks like. And and as you have things more under control where you have space to actually invite others in, because you don't want to be cliquey, but doing all of this, you just are weary, you're dry, and you have nothing left to give. And so, yeah, it's it's a big challenge. It's hard, hard to figure out what that balance is sometimes and definitely need need God and the spirit to lead you for, for what that looks like so that you can be healthy and and have his love to give to others and invite others in as well.